of atonement. I thank God for the Word of God this morning. I'm glad we're not under atonement this morning. Uh, we are under propitiation. Uh, but he, he set up everything for the high priest to do. Uh, when they didn't do it right, it cost uh, Aaron his first two sons. Uh, they died before the Lord. And they dabbed Nabahu as they offered strange fire before the Lord. What strange fire? They did something that was contrary to the Word of God. Listen, if this is the final authority for faith and practice, and it is, then we need to be biblicist and do things in a right manner, and they failed to do that. God struck them down before the Lord, and he told old Aaron, he said, don't, don't you shed a tear, don't you bow your head, don't you mourn for them for what they did. He said they got what they deserved. and no. But what he did, he set the precedent for the priesthood. And we get chapter 16, now he's taking them through the atonement. We dealt with that. He told them to bring a bullock for a sin offering, a ram for a burnt offering, then two goats, two lambs of the goats, and they were also for sin offerings. He used that sin offering for himself. First thing the priest did, he had to offer for himself. I believe that uh, preachers need to be careful with their private lives and, and uh, things they need to offer for themselves first. And I get up in the morning... I talk to the Lord about my sinfulness. Amen. And I'm not trying to live in open sin, but I realize what I am and who He is when I come to Him. And then began to deal with other people, and that's what the high priest did. Now, when you get down to verse number 23, we find that here He has offered. In verse 23, He said, And Aaron shall come into the tabernacle of the congregation. Now he went out, he took care of all the things that he needed to do. He doesn't have his priestly garments on. He's dressed in linen. Now he told him to go back in. You go back into the tabernacle of the congregation and shall put off the linen garments. These linen garments were not the robes of the high priest. Uh, when we went through the book of Exodus, I put slides up here of how they dressed the high priest. And that was when he was representing men to God. But with these linen garments, he represented himself to God. Before he could ever offer atonement for the people, he had to take care of his sin problem first and then go back and offer for the people. So now he said, you go back in, you put the linen garments off, which he put on when he went into the holy place and shall leave them there. He didn't bring them back out. You say, what did they do with them? I have no idea, but you need to understand where the Bible is silent. And you've got to be careful with speculation. The Bible just told him to leave them there. Now, I believe that that was cleaned up in there just like everything else, but the Bible doesn't say anything about it. Why? Because we need to leave our linen garments in the holy place. That that talks of our humility, our righteousness and everything. He told him, you leave them there. And what he did, he told him in verse 24, and he shall wash his flesh with water in the holy place. Now he's not come out yet. He just simply went in, took off all the linen garments, took an all over bath. Amen. Uh, You remember some, probably some of you like, uh, us, uh, there were times in the winter time when we were living out in the country that you just took a sponge bath. Uh, we didn't have showers. We had outdoor showers. Uh, we took a 55-gallon drum and set it up on a stand and ran the gutters uh, off of the roof in over to that to catch the run off of the roof, put screen wire over the top to keep the leaves out of it, and then had little holes come out. You could turn that on and stand out there in front of God and everybody and take shower. Now, first time I took Barbara up there today, she said, we, you mean take a shower out here? I said, That's, it's either that or go to the spring. And let me tell you, that spring water's cold. So we took sponge baths, and then when we got a chance, we took an all-over bath, all right? Now, that's what he's talking about. He took an all-over. He said, wash his flesh with water in a holy place, and then put on his garments. Now he's going to put back on these garments of a high priest. He put the linen garments on in the holy place. He took the 
priestly garments off there. Now he takes them off the linen and puts his priestly garments back on. And notice verse 4, and come forth. Now he's going to come forth out of the holy place. When he comes forth, he's going to offer his burnt offering and the burnt offering of the people and make an atonement for himself and for the people. Now he's ready to make the atonement for the people, the children of Israel. He made one for himself. He also made an offering for the altar and the mercy seat and came out and did it for the brazen altar and went back in. Now he's offering for the sins of the people. He said, make an atonement. That word atonement means to cover or to put something off. I thank God again this morning that our sins are gone. That, that offering has been made once for all when Christ died on the cross of Calvary, died for our sin, and our sins are gone. Cast behind his back as far as the east is from the west into the sea of forgetfulness not to be remembered. You say, well, I remember my sin. God doesn't. Now, can God forget anything? No. But what happens is he chooses not to ever bring it up again. It's something that's settled with God. Somebody said, has it ever occurred you, to you that nothing has ever occurred to God? He's omniscient. But at the same time, how do you forget something? When somebody does something to you and forgive them, you're supposed to forget it. I preached a message one time on forgetting to forgive and forgiving to forget. That may sound a little, but uh, forgetting to forgive. Sometimes we forget to forgive people. When somebody does something to you, forgive them. I had a man one time that stole a valuable piece uh, of jewelry out of our house over here. They came in to spray the ceilings years ago, a long time ago. And a young man took a gold ring and it, he took that and he put it in his pocket. He was a drug addict. He was working with his dad. And when he left, he had the ring with his pocket and he took it. I'll never forget, I was out here cutting the, the bushes and uh, one of the boys came up and said, Dad, what are you going to do about it? I said, I already have, son. I forgot. I forgave him. All right. Now, we don't ever forget. But when you forget to forgive, then you get in trouble. But when you forgive, you forgive to forget. If you tell you forget somebody, don't bring it back up. You know, somebody says, I forgive you. And the first time you get in a the fuss, they bring up the old issue back here. Why? They haven't forgiven you yet. So we find the atonement is a covering, and he offers for himself and for the people. Now, look at verse 25. And the fat of the sin offering shall he burn upon the offering. That was a very important part. I like fat. Anybody like fat? Hey, I love fat, man. I... I love it, uh, steak trimmed with fat. I want you to cook it to where it's a little crisp. You're talking about the best bite of it. I eat fat back. I'm a southerner, all right? Hey, I eat hog jaw. I eat all this. Got a lot of fat in it. I, I like that. Hey, fat's good for you. Fat's good for you. Hey, that's, uh, you need fat into your diet. So they gave the best part. You say, why? It's in the fat to where you get the taste. If you cook a steak, a lot of times you see it marbled. Used to, I thought that was sinew when I was a kid. I thought, I don't want it with that white stuff in it. That, that's fat, all right? And a good steak, will, it'll just melt into that steak, all right? You don't know it, but that fat is in that steak and it's melting in it. So he said here, he's going to offer that. Why? He's going to offer that and burn it to God. He's going to give God his best. Sometimes I fear that we give God our scraps. I think we're all guilty of that. The Old Testament, he said he took out of the mouth of the lion two legs and a piece of an ear. <laughs> Only thing left. Lion, that, that lion is a type of the devil, and he ate that thing, and when he took it out, there's nothing but scraps left. Sometimes we give God two legs and a piece of an ear, and we just give him our parcel. So they gave the best back to God. Look in verse 26. And he that let the goat of the scapegoat, for the scapegoat shall wash his clothes, bathe his flesh in water, and afterward come into the camp. This man that took the two goats, one of them, they, uh, they 
offered to the Lord and burnt that one for an, a sacrifice to God. The other one was a live goat. And they put their hands on the head of that goat and confessed their sins over that goat and sent that goat off into the wilderness. Went by the hand of a fit man into the wilderness where nobody lived, where nobody was at, and turned it away. It's a type of our sins being paid for with God. But in the Old Testament, it was just a covering. They were sent out into the wilderness and that fit man came back and he washed his clothes, he bathed his flesh, but notice what he said, and afterward come into the camp. If you look down in verse 28, afterward he shall come into the camp. He talks about that twice. Reason being, he's referring to something that takes place uh, in the New Testament. Why don't you just hold your hand there, turn over to Hebrews 13. Love the book of Hebrews, writing to the dispersed Jews. Hebrews chapter number 13. We'll look at two verses. <clears throat> verses 12 and verse 13. I'll wait till you get there. Very important verses. The Bible said, wherefore Jesus also. The wherefore goes back to we have an altar. In verse 10, where they have no right to eat which serve the tabernacle for the bodies of those beasts whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned without the camp. Wherefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. Now, when Christ died, they took him to Golgotha, which was outside of the city walls. They took him outside. They didn't want to crucify him inside of the city because that would have messed up their religion. So they, they took him outside of the gates, and he suffered there. Now, notice what it says in verse 13. Let us go forth therefore unto him without the camp bearing his reproach. Now, how do you come to Christ? You've got you to go without the camp, folks. Uh, God's not a camper. God doesn't. Uh, I've, so many times people ask me, what, what camp are you in? You know, they're talking about, are you Calvinist? Are you not? Are you this? Are you that? I tell them I'm not a camper, folks. I believe that we need to stay with the Word of God. But when we go to Christ, you need to understand that we bear the reproach of Christ. The minute you tell people that you're saved, they start watching you. You ever notice that? Oh, if you slip up and say one word, they say, yeah, that's what I thought. You know, they don't realize that we're still human in nature. But at the same time, when you get saved, you go without the camp. You go to the cross, which was outside of the gate of the city, and outside of the camp. And he, he said, hey, let us go forth therefore unto him without the camp. If you live for Christ, you're going to be outside of the camp. You're going to be outside of the norm. You're going to stand out. You're going to catch reproach. The Lord said, yea, and all those that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. He said, they hated me. If they hated me, they're going to hate you. This world's not going to love you if you live for Christ. They're not going to do that. It's just the way it is. Now, when you go back to the book of uh, Leviticus again, he took that goat out. He came back. He washed his clothes, bathed, bathed his flesh in water, and after he had done that, he came into the camp. Verse number 27, And the bullock for the sin offering, and the goat for the sin offering, whose blood was brought in to make atonement in a holy place, shall one carry forth. Now, what are they going to do? They're going to take the bodies without the camp. Notice what he said. Shall one carry forth without the camp. There's that terminology. They shall burn the fire, their skins and their flesh and their dung. So they burnt the bodies. They took the blood. What makes atonement? The Bible said without the shedding of blood, there's no remission. Christ 
died for our sins. But folks, what happened was his death on the cross could not take away sin. He had to take that blood that was shed. It's, it's by the shedding of blood. That's why he said over in First uh, Peter chapter number 1 that we're not redeemed with corruptible things. But he talks about but with the precious blood of Christ. If Christ had died but not shed that blood and put that blood on the mercy seat, we'd still be sinful. But he died, he was consumed without the camp. And they took these animal bodies out. He took them, they, they, their skins, their flesh, and their dung. He took everything except the blood, took them out, and he burned them. Look in verse 28. And he that burned them shall wash his clothes, bathe his flesh in water, and afterward he shall come into the camp. Now use that terminology twice. Verse 26, verse 28. Why? You cannot live on Golgotha. Folks, we're, we're in the world. We are not of the world, but we're in the world. Listen, we, we've got to live in society. We've got to live within the people. We've got to set an example for people. Hey, how, how are they going to hear without a preacher? You say, well, preacher, you need to go tell them. You're a preacher. Every time you share the Word of God, you're a preacher. That's not a pastor in the pulpit. You're a preacher. You're preaching the Word of God. So then faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. I can't reach everybody in Lawrence County, but you've got people that you know that I'll never see. I'll, I'll never have any interaction in. So we're all involved in this. When they went out to where Christ was, that was for salvation, but then they came back into the camp each time, and when they came back in, they came back in with their clothes and their bodies washed. When we walk among the people in this world, we need to walk with a clean mind, with a clean mouth. Uh, like I said, they, they find fault with you so quickly, and I've got to be careful. I'm, I'm a jokester. I like to play with people in Walmart. When I'm handing out tracts, I'm messing with them all the time. I just, I enjoy people. I'm one of them funny guys. I catch them on these little scooters driving around. First thing I do is pull them over, tell them I want to see your license, uh, registration, and proof of insurance on that thing, you know, and, and get them laughing a little bit. Or I pull up beside them. I got up beside of one lady one time. I said, you want to race? And she wasn't on one, though. She was on one of these that she had. She said, I can go five mile an hour for 50 miles. I said, I think I'll stay on the porch. All right, I'm not going, hey, we do that. We've got to live among these people. Now he's talking about though, when you go to Christ and come out, one, you're clean positionally. You need to understand there's three aspects of sanctification. There's your positional sanctification. That's when you come to Christ, He sets you apart for the world. Listen, you're saved forever. You're saved from the penalty of sin. Then during life, you have what's called practical sanctification. That's where we are living a little closer to God every day. We're laying aside the things of the world. It's progressive in its nature, but it delivers us from the power of that sin, and sin has power. Sin, I, I've uh, I thought about people with, with addictions this morning and everything. And let me tell you something. Sin has power to hold. It has power to destroy. And then you have permanent sanctification when one day he'll remove us from the presence of sin. So he's talking about when you go to Christ outside of the camp. You can't live there, folks. You've got to come back in the camp. We've got to live in front of this world and be a witness to them. Verse 29, And this shall be a statute, a law, forever unto you. Now, he's going to tell them as long as this law works, <clears throat> you're going to do it. How long did they do this? They did it actually until Christ rent that uh, uh, veil in, in half. Boy, he, he rent that thing from top to bottom when he, when he, when he died on the cross of Calvary and then when he resurrected, Titus of Rome tore Zerubbabel's temple down in 70 A.D. In 70 A.D., he just leveled that thing. The Lord already prophesied not one stone will be upon another. So we find here a statute 
forever and to you, the seventh month on the tenth day of the month. Now, the seventh month is our October. Their year starts in Nisan. Nisan is in April. So you've got April, May, June, July, August, September, October. So the Day of Atonement is the fifth, uh, tenth day of October. It's in the fall. A lot of things happened in the fall uh, in, in the month of October. Matter of fact, I believe that the Bible teaches that that's when Christ was born. He was born in October toward the end of the month, what we would call October, not December. Now, we'll celebrate next Sunday the birth of Christ. I'm all in. I don't have any problem with that at all, folks. But shepherds were not abiding in the field with their flocks in the middle of the wintertime. They took them in and they cornered them up. It was too cold. It snows over in that country over there in the hill country. They have snow just like we have snow over here. So you find that they weren't there. And we understand that John the Baptist was born in the last of April. The Bible teaches that. He was six months older than the Lord, which takes you to October, last part of October. What a, what a blessed time for them to have the, the uh, Day of Atonement in the 10th month, uh, on the uh, 10th day of the month, so or the 7th month to them, which would be 10 to us. It would be in, in October. But notice what he said, on the 7th day, month, on the 10th day of the month, ye shall want to afflict your souls. What they did, they normally fasted that day. The entire day they fasted. He said that you'll afflict your soul in that day and do no work at all. They didn't cook. They didn't do anything. That day was a day dedicated totally to prayer and to God on the Day of Atonement. So he said, one, you'll afflict your soul. Two, you won't work. Whether it be one of your own country, that means you're Jewish, or one from another country. Notice what he said, a stranger that sojourneth among you. You have in the Bible what are called Jewish proselytes. They're not Jews, and yet they convert, convert to Judaism. And they become what's called a Jewish proselyte. I believe the Ethiopian eunuch was the classic example of that. And then you've got Cornelius. Uh, you've got through the New Testament people that were Gentiles that came to know the Lord the way that we do. And, and they're... Listen, you take the church today, the Bible said, that it's neither Jew nor Gentile, it's not bond, it's not free, it's not male, it's not female. Everybody that gets saved comes into the church of God the same way. We find here that he told me to be a statute forever. It doesn't matter if you're Jew or Gentile, you're going to do this the same way. Now, verse number uh, thirty. For on that day shall the priest make an atonement for you to cleanse you that ye may be clean from all your sins before the Lord. So what happened was he covered that sin for another year. The day of atonement took place where, interesting in verse 31, he called the day of atonement a Sabbath. It shall be a Sabbath of rest unto you. And ye shall afflict your souls by a statute forever. He uses that word Sabbath. When we think of Sabbath, we think of Saturday. And again, Sunday is not the Sabbath first. It's the first day of the week. It's not the seventh day of the week. You look at your Gregorian calendar. Starts over here with Sunday. Ends over here with Saturday. First day of the week. Hey, we're starting a new week today. Not Monday. You say, well, I'll start a new week Monday. No, you're going to start on Sunday. So we find that on Sunday, the first day of the week, but they had the Sabbath, the seventh day of, of the week, but they also had different Sabbaths. All of these feast days were called high days, and they were Sabbaths. Once you look, if you would, over in John 19, we're going to finish up there probably. John chapter 19 in the New Testament. (coughs) 
John chapter 19. I just want to look at uh, uh, one verse in verse number 31 of chapter 19. Christ has just died on the cross of the Calvary. He said it is finished in verse 30, gave up the ghost. Verse 31, the Jews therefore, because it was the preparation that the body should not remain on the cross on the Sabbath day. For that Sabbath day was in a high day, besought Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. He said that when Christ died, it was the preparation. He's talking about the preparation for that day, okay? He said it because it was the preparation. You see that in verse number 31? The preparation for the Sabbath was the day before. There's a lot of things that they did on the Sabbath and, uh, or the day before the Sabbath. Uh, they did their double cooking. They did a lot of things because they didn't cook on the Sabbath or the seventh day of the week. But when Christ died, it re references that to the preparation of the Sabbath. You've got a lot of people today that still believe in what they call uh, Good Friday. They said Christ died on Friday. Christ didn't die on Friday. Bible said as the Jonah was in the belly of the whale three days and three nights. That's 72 hours. He said the Son of Man be in the bowels of the earth three days and three nights, 72 hours. You can't get 72 hours from Friday to Saturday night, early Sunday morning. It won't work anyway. He died on Wednesday. Now let's put that back in perspective. You say, why? Is it preparation for the Sabbath? That means the day he died, the next day was a high day. What day was it? Hey, that was Passover. So when he died, he died at Passover, and it was a high day on Thursday. So Wednesday was a preparation for that high day. So they couldn't touch that body. That's why he lay in that tomb, and nobody bothered that body for three days and three nights. He died on Wednesday, the preparation. The next day they couldn't do anything because that Thursday was a high day. That Thursday was Passover. Then they couldn't touch his body on Friday because it was a preparation for the regular Sabbath, which was on Saturday. So nobody went into that tomb or opened that tomb Thursday, Friday, or Saturday. And when they came on Sunday, he had arisen from his grave. Now, you get back over here, he talks about it's going to be a Sabbath rest. When he's talking about Sabbath, he's not talking about necessarily on the Sunday. But that feast day could actually hit on a Sabbath. Then they would just have two Sabbaths on the same day. But at the same time, he mentioned the Sabbath, and you get to the New Testament, you find that it's a high day. I'm going to try to finish this up real quick. Uh, verse 32, And the priest whom he shall anoint and whom he shall consecrate to minister in the priest's office in his father's stead. Now, he talks about raising up another priest in his father's stead. The high priest were priests as long as they lived. That means when Aaron died. They said historically they thought there were 80 three high priests. That was from Moses' day down to the end of the uh, Levitical priesthood uh, in the New Testament. Eighty-three priests. So now he's talking about the successor. Now, Aaron's still alive. He did everything right. Now he's talking about the Aaronic priesthood. Again, you've got an Aaronic priesthood and you have a Levitical priesthood. God chose the tribe of Levi to be the priesthood. Uh, they didn't have any inheritance in the land. Their inheritance was God. Instead of taking the firstborn of every family, he took a tribe, and he took the tribe of Levi. It's called the Levitical priesthood. Now, every high priest was a Levite. Aaron was a Levite. You go over to the book of Exodus and find out that both his mom and his dad, Moses' mom and dad, were both of the tribe of Levi. So every high priest is a Levite, but not every Levite will become a high priest. They have to be the succession of that line and that family 
going from Aaron. So he's talking about the one that's going to take Aaron's place. Notice what he said, the priest whom he shall anoint and whom he shall consecrate it to minister in the priest's office in his father's stead shall make the atonement. What's he talking about? He's talking about what Aaron did up here in chapter 16. He's talking about what Aaron did. He said, he shall make the atonement, shall put on linen clothes, even holy garments. Verse 33, he shall make an atonement of the holy sanctuary. Now this is what Aaron did when he was dressed in linen. He made an atonement for the sanctuary. He made an atonement for the tabernacle of the congregation. He made an atonement for the altar. He made an atonement for the priest. He made an atonement for the people of the congregation. Then he could take care of the final atonement. But notice what he said. This shall be an everlasting statute unto you to make an atonement for the children of Israel for all their sins once a year. And he did as the Lord commanded Moses. So we find that Aaron did it right. You say, how do you know he did it right? He's still living, ain't he? I got to tell one day, old Don Dees brought a guy to church, an older man lived next door to Brother Don. He had the biggest black eye. I mean, that thing was closed. When he came out, I said, did, did Brother Don hit you in the eye? And he looked at me and he said, no, sir. He living, ain't he? <laughs> All right. The high priest did it right. Now he's telling those that will follow in his line, now you're going to have to do it. We used to use the word in Kentucky, persactly the way uh, that your father did it, all right? What he's setting up here, this is not just for Aaron, and then they can later do anything they want. There's no variation under the law. For as long as they had that priesthood and they had the law, they did chapter 16, jot, and tittle the same way all the way through. He made sure that they understood the law. Then with Nadab and Abihu, the penalty under the law. If this high priest didn't get it right, folks, he died. And he died before the Lord. And he told his successors, listen, you're, not, you're, you're to follow the way of your father. You know, we bring that down to the day. The Bible talks about that uh, we're to maintain the old paths. Seek those old paths. Wherein is the good way? You look, you look back to our forefathers. I'm not talking about modern religion. We're to maintain the ways of our forefathers, and they're called the old paths, and they're well trodden. They're well trodden. They're easy to understand. But the people said, we'll not do it. And that's where we are today. We as God's children need to remain in the old paths. This new modern, newfangled religion going on out here dancing in the aisles and rock and roll bands. And hey, folks, they have no resemblance to what God ever intended a church to be like. We're not an entertainment center tonight. We're going to have a lot of extra singing. Uh, we're going to have a good time tonight. But hey, but we're not here to entertain folks. I don't want the people that sing up here to entertain you. We've gotten into that so much, even in the independent Baptist movements. You know, they got all these big singings and the Smokies and all this type stuff up there. People that drive 500 miles to be entertained, they won't drive across town to worship. What I want God's people to do tonight, I want them to worship. I don't want them to be entertained. We're not entertainers. But as we sing, we sing as unto the Lord. As we play instruments, we play as unto the Lord. Everything is unto the Lord. All right, that's what he's telling them here. He said, you've got to follow the way of your fathers. If our fathers were wrong, then we're in trouble. But friend, if we don't follow our fathers who were right, then we're still in trouble. So we follow the old paths, and that's what he was doing with them. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we love you. We thank you, Lord, for the day. I pray, Father, that you would meet the need of every heart today, Lord. You knew what we needed before we ever came to church. And I just pray that God would, through the word of God, through the singing, through the fellowship, Lord, just meet the need of every heart. I pray you'd bless this day, Lord. Make it a special day today. Make it a good day. And we love you in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, we're going to the prayer rooms.